So I'm Doug Sillers. Uh, I'm traveling Europe with my family, working as a digital nomad and freelancing. Um, so right now my family's in the south of France. So I'm traveling with my wife, the four kids, and the dog. And we've been traveling around Europe for about a year. And we did a year a couple years before too. So two of the last three years we've been here just being digital nomads. So a little bit about me. I used to work at AT&T, uh, but right now I'm freelance. So I am doing developer relations, so working with companies trying to help them talk to developers. Um, I also do a lot of performance stuff, so I can audit native apps websites, and I run workshops on images, video, and web performance. Um, there's only one Doug Sillers on the internet, so on Twitter, email, my website, and I'll post the slides on my slide share, they're all Doug Sillers. So pretty easy to find. Uh, there is another Doug Sillers on the internet, he's a chef in Glasgow. Uh, I connected with them on LinkedIn because, like, you kind of have to, right? Um, so before I talk about performance, this is called the first cliff walk. And what it is, is it's nailed onto the side of a mountain. And for free, you can walk along it. <clears throat> Lovely, right? How many of you sort of get this feeling in the pit of your stomach when you think about walking across just, you know, basically a, a grate that's nailed into the side of a mountain? Anyone? And it sort of freaks you out. When we walked across this two years ago on our first trip to Europe, my six-year-old jumped the whole way. <laughs> and it rattled the whole thing. It, I think she was doing it to freak out her older sister, to be honest with you. But two years ago, Ericsson did a study, and they put sensors on people's heads to measure stress responses to different stimuli. And one of the things they found is, you know, when you think about queuing up for a line, that raises your stress level. And they found that walking along the edge of a cliff raises your stress level. But interestingly, they found that experiencing mobile delays <laughs> actually more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. So if we're building a mobile experience and it's slow, that feeling you guys had just like 90 seconds ago, that's what your customers are feeling when they're using your app. And that's really not where we want to be. There's a lot of data on this. Google found that a three second delay on a mobile site causes 53% of people to abandon your website. So if your site is slow, people are gonna go away. Another study found that for every half a second of, of delay, people got more frustrated and less engaged. Classic studies, two independent studies, same year, Amazon and Walmart found that for every 100 milliseconds of delay, they lost money. So if you're building an e-commerce site, like maybe you care about that. Um, and then my favorite stat is of course, 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. <laughs> that is also a real study, I'm not making it, maybe they made up this, the result, but I'm quoting their made up result. Um, so we're building these experiences for mobile and as you know, mobile phones get more powerful and bigger and you know, as networks get faster and faster, our customers are demanding immersive and rich experiences that they want to be fast, right? So how do we balance that? That's not an easy thing to do. The more stuff we throw at them, the more you're going to slow down the devices, especially when you start thinking about Android Go. You guys know about Android Go? Yeah, I see a lot of nods. For those who don't know, it's really low-powered phones that are running the latest version. They're all running Oreo. But they're so low powered that Google had to build special versions of Maps and Gmail and everything else so they don't crash. They're, they're on such slow processors, they have such low memory. Um, I call them Tesco phones, <laughs> right? You go to Tesco, it's like dog food, toilet paper, mobile phones, right? The, those are the phones that they're selling at Tesco. I, I went to Car Phone Warehouse and they're like, there's a Nokia there and it's like 55 pounds. Right? And it's running Oreo. You're like, whoa, that's awesome. And then you look at the specs and you're like, whoa, that's not awesome. <laughs> um, other problems we have with mobile networks is this is the tool I worked on at at and back in the day. Um, but cellular networks are high latency. So establishing a connection on 3G can take two and a half seconds. That's not like packets going back and forth. That's like the radio on the phone saying, hey, tower, I want to make a connection. OK. And they go back and forth. And then packets start going. Even on 4G, it can be a quarter of a second. And then every round trip is 100 to 200 milliseconds. 
So there's a lot of latency, there's a lot of delay every time you're trying to send all of this rich, fancy content over cellular networks. This is the tool we built. And what we're doing, and it's sort of funky because the colors are a little weird with the projector, but you know, we'll roll with it. Um, we're running packet traces on mobile devices. So these are all the packets coming in out of the phone. And what I'm monitoring right here is we're modeling the cellular radio. And because there's such a long delay setting up the connection, all carriers keep the radio on for like 8 to 10 to 15 seconds after the last packet is sent in anticipation of more packets coming. Now, you, want, you don't want to leave the radio on too long because like I have my phone plugged in right here. Why? Because the batteries are toast, right? If you leave the radio on too long, your battery's flat and we're always charging our phones, so that's not good. Um, but if you keep it too short, then you get this high latency all the time. So we're, we're working with this, this issue. But if you think about this, if your app or uh, your website is sending keep alive or pings all of the time, you're not letting the radio turn off. And if you're not letting the radio turn off, you're draining the battery as fast as if they're streaming a movie. So just one thing to think about when you're building uh, your website or things like that. So where I want to talk about today is some of the tools that I use uh, to look at apps and websites. Uh, some of the best practices that we've come up with to speed up apps and websites, and then see some of the results. Um, so this is the tool I built at at and It used to be called the Application Resource Optimizer. It's now called Video Optimizer because marketing wanted a new name. Um, <laughs> it still analyzes iOS, Android apps. It gives you all sorts of awesome results. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And then for the web, I'm going to talk about web page test. Has anyone here used web page test before? I see some nods. Uh, another free and open source tool that's great for looking at web page performance. But let's start with Video Optimizer. You install it on your computer, you plug in your phone, I've got an Android phone connected. You, there are a bunch of different choices when you start collecting a trace. The first thing you can do is you can change the speed of the network. Why would you want to do that? Well, I've got great LTE right here in Bristol. Um, but in May, I spent a month in West Cork, Ireland. And in Ireland, the further west you are from Cork, the longer you say the word west. And I was in West Cork. It was like a two-hour drive. And that's literally what they do. I said, oh, I'm in Bali Dahab. And they're like, oh, that's West Cork. Um, and my Airbnb said, it's got Wi-Fi. It has Wi-Fi, but what they didn't say is connected to a 3G router that only gets edge. <laughs> um, it's important to see what your app or your website looks like on slower network connections because a lot of the world isn't in the middle of a city on a really fast device. Android, so if there are people with Android Go devices in West Cork and like, what the hell does the internet look like to them? Like it's a completely different world from us with our, you know, we're developers, we probably have a pretty fancy Android phone. We're pretty used to being on LTE. Slow down the network speed to see what happens. Facebook used to have 2G Tuesdays where they turned down the Wi-Fi. And so everything was 2G. Um, we can record the video while we're collecting the trace and then we run the trace and it goes. And so this is what it looks like when I collect a trace. Here I am testing a real estate app. I'm looking at houses that are for sale that I can't afford. And up in the upper corner, you can see there's a key going. So there's a VPN running on Android. And that's letting me run a man in the middle to collect all the packets. Um, and so I test the application. I'm collecting all the packets. I do everything I want to do. And when I'm done, I press stop. That stops the data collection, transfers everything off the phone onto my computer. And then I can do some analysis. So typically, you've got a packet capture. What, what tool do you guys go to? Wireshark? Wireshark fans? awesome tool, right? It's really great. I'm still learning how to use it, and I use it all the time, right? It's complicated. So we wanted to make Video Optimizer, or Aero, a lot easier. So we came up with 40 best practices, and basically if you get a green check mark, you did okay on that one, and if you get a red X, we tell you how to fix that in your application, right? If we can point you to right where the problems are, that's a lot easier than having to dig through a Wireshark trace. And I kind of broken down all the best practices into different groups, files and images, connections, HTML security, and video. And I'll go through a few of those as we go through the talk today. Web page test is kind of the same thing. You go to webpagetest.org. They have locations all around the world. Um, here I'm in Virginia. They actually have real devices. So I'm testing on a real Motorola G4 in Virginia. 
And so I can change the speed, all of these are parameters, things I can do, and then I can run tests. And this is what the test results look like. So you get some grades. This is a web page I built that takes 19 seconds to load on a desktop, right? It, that's because it's uh, 11 and a half megabytes. I built it to be slow. Um, and then they also have this really cool thing over here showing you the cost. So they've gone through and calculated the average cost for people to download a certain number of megabytes. And that one gets $5 signs, so that's really bad. You want $1 sign. So it gives you all sorts of great metrics on how to improve the speed of um, your web page. All right. So what can we do to optimize content delivery? So redirects. The first time on an Android phone that you hit google.com, it does a redirect to www.google.com, and then it does another redirect to the HTTPS. There's two redirects. And if you look at the timing there, the first one's about a second, one, the second one's about a second, you know, two second delay on this download. It used to be that the second time you visited, you still had one redirect, they've now fixed that. So the second time you type in google.com on your phone, there are no redirects, it's fast. But it's just interesting that even the first time you hit google.com, it isn't optimized. And actually, web page test gives them an F for time to first byte. Um, this is a native app that I tested. So this is a result from, from Video Optimizer. And it was a music streaming app. And so every time it made a request for the album art, it did a 302 re a redirect. So it said, album art, no, it's not here. Go over there. And it downloaded it again. And I don't know if you can see this, but it did 242 302 redirects in 10 minutes. I did the math and it added about 10% to the amount of time it took me to use the app to browse because each redirect just adds a couple hundred milliseconds. To make things worse, 33 of them were 404s, right? 404s obviously are really bad. We don't want to have 404s in our app. Um, but one thing that I have found in traces with video optimizer is I found a 418 response code. Anyone know HTTP 418? I'm a teapot. I'm a teapot. All right, we have a lot of teapot fans here. Um, it goes back to, it was an April Fool's joke when everybody had coffee machines with cameras. So you could go to the web page and see if there was coffee in the break room before you got up, right? Because you were lazy and you didn't want to make coffee. Um, so for April Fool's, they actually had a I am a teapot. And, uh, NPM had an issue with I'm a teapot about a month ago. And they were migrating from Fastly to Cloudflare, and they knew that if there was a certain issue, there might be an error. And their developers were like, let's do something fun. Let's make it I'm a teapot. And 5%, it was dropping the port numbers when they did the migration. It's like 5% of people in NPM for about a day were getting I'm a teapot. But to me, it's like the ultimate geek thing, because some developers are like, they're hee 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 hee, I'm a teapot. The only person who sees it is people looking at like response headers, <laughs> which is another nerd somewhere else, <laughs> right? It's really awesome. The other one that you're seeing that I've seen a lot of this summer is 451, not available for legal reasons. It actually goes back to Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451, and it's because so many American news organizations want to track the hell out of Americans, but they can't do it in, a, in Europe because of GDPR, so they just put up a we can't show it for legal reasons because it'll get sued in, in Europe. What else can slow down web pages? Third party interference. So this is a video streaming app that I was testing. And I picked this TV show. The first thing that happens is an ad. We all kind of hate ads, but we're kind of resigned that we have to watch an ad before we can watch a show. Network trace, because network traces are fun. Uh, the, the red line at the top is the throughput. These are all the packets. And so that's the, that's the video being downloaded, right? But what's happening right here, there's a lot of traffic, but not a lot of throughput. What's going on before the video's downloading? <coughs> well, that's the blue line. These are all of the TCP connections that were made on my phone. Blue line is when I said, start watching the video. That's the video. And we know that's the video because the byte count says five megabytes, right? That's not, that's not, that's not really, a hard thing there. 14 connections in between, I looked at them all, they're all analytics. <laughs> so remember Heisenberg said the more you study a system, the more you perturb it, you're not actually seeing reality. It's in action, right here. Um, on a fast connection, it was adding two seconds right here. 
On a slower connection, like two, three megabits per second, like a common mobile connection, this is four seconds. And it actually, that's, in, that's when they start downloading the video, but it was actually adding like 10 seconds before the video actually showed up on the screen. And that's just the ad. Then you've got to watch a 30 second ad, and then you get to watch the movie. Guess what they're not preloading after the ad stops? <laughs> the ad stops and we're like, oh shit, now we're gonna start downloading the movie. So you get another 10 seconds of delay. We worked with them on that and they fixed it. Um, <laughs> all right, content delivery. So how many of you have ordered something from Amazon and you get this giant box and then you pull out like 15 yards, meters of, uh, do you guys use meters or yards? Both. All right. It's different when I'm through Europe. It's really fun. Um, and then in the bottom you find that your kids ordered a pencil. Right? We do a lot of this while we're sending content over networks. We can make the files smaller. We don't have to send a big box. We can send a little tiny box. So let's look at the different types of content that we send over the network. This is the average web page according to the HTTP archive. And if we break it down, it's basically 25% text files, 50% images, and 25% video. And this is based on half a million websites. Um, you may be surprised that every single website is 25% video, but it's just averages being thrown out. You know, at the sites that have video use so much video, it throws off the averages. So if, if Jeff Bezos came and stood in the corner there, our average salaries would all be $100 million a year. <laughs> it's not going to make us any more money. But the websites that have video throw off the average so much, that's why it looks so big there. But let's look at text compression. This is that same um, application. And when you fire it up, this is what most video streaming apps look like, right? It populates the name of the TV shows and eventually the, the pictures of the stars of the show show up. And, and then you can start looking at it. This is populated by a JSON file. So that JSON file lists the title of the show. It has the URL for the images, right? So you need that file to populate this screen. It's only 130 kilobytes, but they didn't compress it. And if you just gzip it, it's 16 kilobytes. It's going to download faster, so you can start asking for the pictures faster. They get on the screen faster, right? It's a cascading effect. Um, if you want to make it even smaller, you can use Brotly, which is a newer algorithm that's gzip compatible. Um, all of the Google compression engineers live in Switzerland, so they name them all after bread and pastry products. <laughs> and so Brotly means little rolls. Um, so I'm kind of a, a nerd when I go to Switzerland, I take photos of all the pastries in the grocery store because they're all Google compression app, you know. <laughs> um, images, 50% of the average web page. What can we do to make images smaller? Um, anyone recognize this logo? No, no? all right, all right. It's a, it's a social media company. Um, so, so vector graphics are really cool. Rather, what they are is in XML, you basically draw or you put out parameters to draw shapes. And what's great about them is you can stretch them and you can make them smaller and because they're shapes, they just stretch and they never get pixely or anything like that. So this website in Brazil made the Facebook logo and they created an SVG of it. And that's the SVG, I opened it up in some text editor, right? But look down at the bottom and I'll enlarge it, it says Adobe Illustrator, and then there's like, <laughs> and then if you look at the little thumbnail thing right here, there's a lot of Adobe Illustrator stuff. Um, when I clean it up, it looks like that. In fact, there was 1.3 megabytes of Adobe Illustrator stuff. Clean it up, it's 905 bytes, gzip it, it's under half, or just slightly over half a kilobyte, right? They had five of these on their website. So, test, right? There was five some megabytes of uncompressed SVG, you know, unoptimized SVG files in production on this website. Um, easy fix, but just something to look for. Uh, another app I was testing, I was in it's another video streaming app, but um, I was reading up on Frank Sinatra and they had all these cool pictures. This is my phone screen. And the image in the bottom left 
was 1.8 megapixels, 1500 by 1200, and that ends up being one and a half megabytes. Now you could imagine that could take a long time to download if you're on a slow 4G or a 3G connection. So what can we do to make that image smaller? Well, if we just look at the size of my screen, half of 1440 is 720, I just made it three times smaller, or you know, four times smaller, right? 1.8 to 0.4. And lo and behold, when you get rid of, you know, three quarters of the pixels, it's three, you know, it's 25% the size of the original image. So that's a great way to make that smaller and no one will ever notice the difference. I just took away the pixels. No one will, it's still gonna fit on the screen just fine. The other thing you could do is Google recommends that any image you put on the web, you just save it at 85% quality. So what that does is it removes some of the pixels, it lowers the quality of the image, but actually when I save this at 85% quality, you see the the, it looks like that. In the grand scheme of things, no one's gonna see that difference. Um, it looks pixely here just because of the projector. It's actually a really nice looking image. Um, when I do that, it gets 64% smaller, 550K. I can combine both of those, right? Make it the right size, make it 85% quality, and it's almost 90% smaller, just with two modifications. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy way to make that download a lot faster. And do that to all the other six images, this page is gonna load a lot faster. Quick question, you mean what if you ask JPEG compression quality? Yeah, JPEG compression quality. What's interesting though is 85% in Photoshop isn't the same as 85% in any other tool. 85% is a subjective thing. Use Moz JPEG. But yeah, Moz JPEG would work as well. I mean, all of these are great. Moz JPEG is a different JPEG format that, would, that has better compression. Um, but, you know, there are lots of ways you can make the images, um, you can make the images smaller. Uh, when I look at how many websites of the half million websites that use it 85%, uh, a full third do not. So, you know, one third of the internet is not making those, in, lowering the image quality. When you look at those that fail, this is a Lighthouse report. So Lighthouse is in dev tools, it's in web page test. The median page would be 2.8 seconds faster on 3G and say 420 kilobytes. But I think we can do even better. So I uploaded that image to Cloudinary. It's a, it's a um, cloud-based optimization image hosting service. And you can just change the parameters in the URL, so quality 85 width 720 builds the image that I just showed you a minute ago. They have a, there's a thing called um, structural similarity, and the idea there is you lower the quality to where the human eye can't tell a difference, and that's usually, often you can squeeze out a little bit more than 85%, and you can see when I go to QAuto, I get another 50 kilobytes or so that I save off of this image. And then finally, I'm doing this on Chrome, or Android, I can use WebP, right? Another format is written by Google. I get it down to 84 kilobytes, 95% smaller than that original image. Now you might be saying, well, WebP's great, Doug, if I'm building for Android or I'm building for Chrome, and you're right. Uh, WebP is supported in Chrome and in Android browsers today. However, it is in development for MS Edge, and Safari, Safari and Firefox are experimenting support of WebP. So if you build web stuff, WebP might be a format for all the major browsers, maybe by the end of the year. That'd be really cool. Now we talk image sizing. These are all the Android devices that hit Akamai in one day. And so the size of the box is how many of each device. So these are all Samsung S7s, S8s. Um, the color is how fast the processor is. So as you go out here towards where there's not very many, there are a lot of really, really slow devices that don't have a lot of market share. So how do you optimize images for all those different devices? On the web, you use the responsive images. So you build a different image for different screen sizes. It looks something like this, but a live demo is always cooler than looking at code. So we'll see how this works. That's the email for the next presentation. So this is the image, and when I shrink the size of this page, you'll see a new image pop into place. And I change the color from sepia to full color so you can see. They're all 25 kilobytes apart, so you'd never waste a lot of data when new images are being downloaded. 
for this size, if it's the screen is that size, you're never wasting more than 25 kilobytes. All the way down to there, right? So you can get all these different size images and they're optimized uh, for the device within 25 kilobytes. Um, you can also see, just because it's fun, I put the CPU parameter in every other one and the, the cloud-based tool does the CPU for me on the fly, which is kind of fun. Uh, another thing that's really common right now is preview images. The idea that, you know, just something fills the space of the image before the full image is downloaded. So this is Google image search. I'm looking for cats in costume, as people do. You get a green blob before the dinosaur cat and an orange blob before the pumpkin cat, right? So you get, it, it fills in, you know an image is coming, and then when the image is downloaded, the actual image pops into place. There's a fun tool that uses SVGs for this. So this is an SVG of the waterfall. So it's not just green, you can see the green and white kind of interplaying. This is like compressed 500 bytes. So you just put in your HTML as a background image. That loads while this 120K image is downloading and then it gets replaced when that image is in place. It's a pretty cool way to um, show the content is there. And the other great thing is because the page, the image is laid out on the screen, you don't get like the text moving around as images download, which is really annoying when you're trying to read an article and your text disappears. Um, another thing that comes along with this is on the web, this study came out earlier this year, they found that 57% of people don't scroll beyond the first viewport of a web page. Yeah, so this is, and this is, it's, this is desktop. But imagine you have a, a mobile site that looks like this with seven images on it but nobody ever sees those four images there. So what if you didn't load them on initial load of that page and you lazy loaded them with JavaScript later on? Now you're only loading two images at page load time, that, that web page is gonna load a lot faster, two instead of six. Now, today you have to do that with JavaScript, but in Chrome Canary, there's an experimental flag for lazy loading where they'll just lazy load all the images below the fold. Um, I'm playing around with that right now and it's pretty cool. Um, most websites don't do any lazy loading. 60% of all websites fail the lazy loading lighthouse test. So, but when you do this, it saves like 500 kilobytes. Like it's a pretty impressive way to make your web page run faster. Next thing I want to talk about is animated GIFs. This is my goat Nora. And I took a video of my goat Nora. Right, she's eating a leaf. And I took that with my phone, 1.4 megabytes. And I made it into a GIF because we need more goats on the internet. Now, if you look at the, it's 256 colors because GIFs are from the 80s. Um, and if you read the spec for the GIF format, it says we have an animated format, but we don't recommend anyone uses it. <laughs> and the reason for that is animated GIFs end up being bigger than the videos that were, that were recorded. And the reason for that is Videos can compress through the time frame, but GIFs are just a flipbook of, GIF, of images. So there's no compression, it's just a series of pictures of my goat. But if I make it an MP4, 256 colors, strip out the audio channel, there are a lot of like background videos on web pages that play silently, but they still download the audio channel. Right, pretty simple way to make your videos smaller. It's 250 kilobytes, way faster. Uh, this is three megabytes, that's 3.8 megabytes. So your iOS and your Safari users are gonna get that content a lot faster than the other browsers. So I expect this support is gonna go into other browsers as well very soon. That sort of leads us into video, and I'll just go really quickly through video, but when a video takes a long time to load, people get mad. And we know that when people get mad with mobile devices, they throw their phones. Um, video startup. Everyone will wait two seconds for a video to start up. But every second thereafter, you lose 5.8% of your viewers. So if it takes a long time for a video to start up, you're losing your customers. If it's a short play video, like a video of a cat wearing a shark costume on a Roomba chasing a duck, people after two seconds are like, what the hell did I click on? And they give up. They start questioning their life choices about like, why they were watching that video. 
But if you're watching a movie or a TV show, you're going to hang out a little longer because you're going to watch a 20-minute movie or, or a 20-minute TV show. You're going to hang out a little longer. So people will hang out longer for long play videos. So what can we do to improve video startup? Well, you might think, let's just set preload equals auto. What preload equals auto does is it downloads the whole movie, whether or not people press play or not. So this is the web page, and it downloaded the entire movie. Have you ever been on your mobile phone and you see a movie at the bottom of, of a web page, and you're like, I'm not going to click it because I'm on cellular and I don't really want to waste all my data. In this case, the web page decided for you and downloaded it for you. So I would recommend using metadata or none unless there's a really high probability that most people hitting that page are going to watch the movie. If people are going to watch it, sure, download it as quickly as possible. But if it's only like 50-50, maybe just use metadata, which just downloads the first couple seconds of the video. Video streaming. Video streaming, what happens is there's a list of different bit rates, of different screen sizes. They all get downloaded in a manifest file. The player chooses one, starts downloading all the streams into the buffer, Buffer fills up in the video plays. This is a example manifest file, right? And so you get all these different bit rates. And the player generally just picks the first one. It has to start somewhere. It has no idea what the bit rate of the network connection is. In this case, it's picking an 8.5 megabit per second video stream. Now, even on the fastest Wi-Fi connection, this takes forever to start up on my mobile device. And what ends up happening is the player picks that 8.5 megabit stream, the buffer takes a long time to fill, the player knows that that's bad because the video isn't playing, and it quickly switches to a different bit rate, a lower quality bit rate. And we can see that. This is from Video Optimizer. I tried to download the 1080p video. So this is the manifest file for 1080p. This is segment zero. It gives up and starts downloading the 600 kilobit segment 0, 1, 2, 3. So you're getting a lower quality video. You get a delay here, right? It's trying the high quality video. It gives up and then starts downloading the lower quality video. So it takes longer and you get a lower quality video. So what most websites do is they actually go with the lowest quality resolution as the first one. And you've seen this when you watch a movie and it's really pixelated to start. And then two seconds in or four seconds in, it snaps to a really nice bit rate. It's downloading the lowest quality to get it to start fast. And then when it has an idea of what the better bit rate is, it snaps to one of these higher quality bit rates. Amazon does something completely different because all of their movies are long play or TV shows. They know you'll wait a little longer because you're watching a 20 minute or an hour long TV show. They start with one right in the middle, like 1.2 megabits per second. It takes a second or two longer to start up, but it looks beautiful from the very instant the video starts. And so they know that they can get away with that for the type of videos that people watch with their service. And to them, it's very important that the quality is great from the very beginning. So it's really interesting. Different people do different things. And you know, obviously, most people are starting at the low. About 20% start in the middle. And then a few people start at the high, which I don't recommend. So stalling, what leads to stalls? In this case, the video download is faster than the playback. So we can see the buffer is filling up. Oh, the buffer is full. It's not going to stall. In this case, in this next example, the buffer fills up. The video starts playing, and it stops because there's not enough video in the buffer to continue playing. And this is aggravating, but to me, it's this next step that's even more aggravating. You can see that there's more video in the buffer but the player didn't start because it's no, it's just going to stall again in a second. And if you guys are like me, you just hit play and you watch that half a second until the, you know until it stops again, and then you just keep pressing play until it you know makes its way through the movie. Um, and so what's happening here is obviously they're balancing the network with the playback, and it can't keep up. It just can't download the right bit rate to make it work. Um, Another thing that leads to stalls is this is that same group of bit rates, and there's this giant jump in the middle from like 1.2 megabits to 3.5 megabits per second. It's like a 3x jump where most people are streaming on mobile. And so what ends up happening is the player is trying to optimize, and it keeps jumping back and forth between these two because the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. 
And what ends up happening is you see segment four is downloaded twice, segment five is downloaded three times, segment six is downloaded three times. It's not downloading seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right? It's not getting ahead of the game and filling up the buffer. The player's getting so confused, it's downloading the same content over and over and over again. That could lead to a stall. So in conclusion, thanks everybody for hanging in here, but we have ways to speed up the content. We can make things smaller, compress the text files, compress the images, make the video as small as possible, and then the content gets delivered faster. It will show up on the glass of the screen faster. Your customers will end up being happier. Uh, because it's faster. So the tools I used for these studies is web page test. I used video optimizer for native stuff. Uh, they're both free, so feel free to download them and play with them. That's a book I wrote called High Performance Android Apps. It's an O'Reilly book. That's the PDF if you want to download that. Um, help yourself to that. And then um, Cloudinary is a cloud-based video hosting and image hosting tool that does a lot of optimizations on the fly for you. So take a look at all of those. I'll post the slides up on the meetup. Uh, tonight so you can get these later if you want to do it that way as well. And so with that, thank you very much everyone for hanging in and listening to all this. Thank you.